All right, thank you, Mindy. And thank you everybody that is joining us. Uh, my name is Frank Corriego and I wanna welcome you to the uh, fourth annual Kansas Ham Conference. It's a event that we've been holding since 2019 and we're very pleased that attendance continues to grow and, and the gamma of speakers gets better and better. Um, Today, we have a PAC agenda, so we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you again to today's conference, the fourth annual Kansas Hemp Conference, on behalf of the Kansas Hemp Consortium, Kansas for Hemp, Planet Association, and Wichita State University, SBDC. And again, we have a PAC agenda, so without any further ado, I'm going to pass it over to my co-host, Sarah Stevens. Thank you, Frank, and thanks to everybody that's joining us online or watching the recording later. Uh, we're very honored to have you here today on 2.22 at 2.02, and we just appreciate the uh, group of speakers and presenters. So in addition to myself and Frank today, Kelly Ripple and Robin Bonfall with, the, uh, Can with Kansans for Hemp and Planted Association of Kansas are our co-hosts, and they will be doing introductions and Speaking, uh, Kelly's going to provide a legislative update later in the session. And he, uh, here in just a minute, we're going to introduce Dr. Jason Griffin with the K-State Pear Horticulture Center. And I'm very excited to hear what Dr. Griffin has learned recently at the Multi-State Variety um, Trial Conference. He's also going to share a little bit about his season last year and also what he plans to grow at the Pear Horticulture Center this year. Following uh, Dr. Griffin, we're going to hear from Dana Ladner with Kansas Department of Agriculture, Education and Compliance Department, and she's going to share some results from last year's hemp season, in addition to very important upcoming deadlines that we need to abide by to become hemp producers this year. And then we're going to uh, kind of wrap up today with a segment we're calling the Ask a Producer segment, and Kelly Ripple is going to host that, and our featured producer, featured grower, is Jim Garman with Canico. So we really appreciate everybody being here today. We do have a prize to give away and uh, there's a picture of it on the Facebook event if you wanna take a look, but it's a, a bunch of great hemp products from Midwest Hemp Technology, Tallgrass Hemp and Cannabis, Kansans for Hemp, Cannabis Blogs, uh, some hemp food, some hemp t-shirts from New West Genetics. So just please be active in the chat with your question. And uh, there's the there's the prize packet. Thank you, Mindy. <laughs> Thank you, Mindy. Um, be active in the chat with your questions or just letting us know you're there. And um, Mindy will be choosing a winner from among chat participants at the end of the event. So try to stay on. We're going to try to keep it to an hour today. Uh, we're going to keep it moving. And we really appreciate you being here today. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly Ripple. And he's going to tell us about our just the main goals for what we're trying to accomplish here today. All right, can you hear me okay? Yep, thanks yes, Kelly. Sir. Very good, okay, so our goals today are, are pretty simple. Um, so by working together in unity, we wanna see that the industrial hemp production thrives in Kansas. Um, at one time before prohibition, um, 1863 to be exact, Kansas was the leading domestic producer of industrial hemp, and um, we have the right conditions to return to that place of, of prominence. But this is still new. Uh, the infrastructure is still coming together, and you know the regulations are, are all still uh, settling and evolving. We know that good communication and collaboration is, is best for um, planning long-term success. So we hope that this event and those that follow the rest of this year uh, contribute positively and, and can encourage ag experts and business owners to participate in the industry. And so, Rob and I will pass it on to you. You got it, buddy. And we've said it already. We'll say it again. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. I'm already seeing activity in the chat. So continue. We want to hear your comments and everything, what you're feeling about this budding industry. See what I did there? Um, so this is our fourth annual Kansas Hemp Con Conference, and it's not too late to text your friends or invite them to join. We're just getting started. So feel free to remind people it's happening right now. And because you guys are registered, you will also get the recorded link so that you can access this information at any time in the future. Um, if you're posting about the event on social media today, thank you. Please continue to do that. 
Um, foreshadowing, our next event is going to be May 5th. So when you're posting today, feel free to start saying the next round of these is going to be May 5th and use the hashtag KSHemp2022 so that we can help monitor and see, increase the connections basically. We are attempting to stay up to date online during the event and we appreciate your support on social. With that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Frank, as you introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jason Griffin. Thank you very much. Um, and it is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jason Griffin. He is the director of the Kansas State University Pear Horticulture Center and lead hemp researcher in the state, as well as for K-State. I'm going to quickly read a, a small bio for Dr. Griffin, I think is important for us all to realize his background and his expertise and where does he come from. Um, Dr. Griffin was, uh, Jason Griffin was born in, in New York where he grew up on a golf course. From there, his interest in the outdoors was obvious as he was always mowing the grass and taking care of the plants on his parents' golf course. Griffin's greens, Griffin started his collegiate experience with every intention of becoming a golf course superintendent. Well, that changed, but after taking a landscape class at SUNY, uh, he became very interested in, this, in that side of horticulture. Those interests in horticulture later led Griffin to pursue a bachelor's of science at Cornell University, a master's in science and a PhD in horticulture at North Carolina State University. So he's an Eastern transplant to, you know, sunny and windy Kansas, and we are very glad to have him. Currently, Dr. Griffin serves as the director of the John C. Pear Horticulture Center in Wichita, uh, Wichita, Kansas. Of course, the, the Pear Center is an applied research facility which works with essentially all horticultural crops, such as trees, shrubs, fruits, vegetables, and turf grasses. There are currently three full-time staff and two or three students during the summer who work at the Pear Center. Dr. Griffin's research is primarily focused around woody plants in a DePair center, he works on a variety of research projects, including nursery production, landscape utilization, and cultivar evaluations. Outside of his job, Dr. Griffin enjoys spending time outside, home brewing his own beer and hard apple cider. I'm gonna to have to uh, have a chat with him about, about sampling those. As you notice, my uh, image fades in and out <laughs> because uh, as I've been told, my face is for radio. So the screen refuses to take me. Sarah, on the other hand, is there all the time, obvious reasons. But uh, again, it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Griffin with us. He's been with us from the very beginning and he brings a level of expertise like uh, very few organizations can brag about in, in the hemp environment. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, Frank. Not sure where you got all the information. It's scary what you can find online, I guess. <laughs> yes, ne next time you're in town, we can, we can share some, some hard cider. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here. Here we go. So what I'd like to do today is just chat a little bit with you about our growing season last year, some of the data we've got. Uh, I did just last week attend the uh, USDA multi-state industrial hemp conference with colleagues from around the country. A um, little bit about that. And probably most recently, my, there we go. Maybe it'll work for me. So just recently as of last week, website is right up here at the top. Uh, USDA re released their um, national hemp report. And there's the numbers from 2021 across the country. And I guess some of the big numbers, if you want to download the report and look at it, you can go in all the detail and get all the state information uh, from the various states around the country. And it's a little more detailed than this. This is just the big picture. Um, probably one of the most important numbers right there is all hemp. This is all hemp production in 2021, 824 million. So just shy of, of a billion dollars in the, uh, was, was what brought hemp brought in in 2021. You can go down the list. Most of the report is on outside hemp, um, all hemp outside at 712 million. You can see grain hemp produced outside. You got acres harvested, a little over 8,000 acres. Interesting, 
530 pounds per acre average. I love looking at this because here is seed hemp produced outside. Same yield, 530 pounds per acre, but look at the difference here. $6 million revenue for grain hemp, 41 and a half million uh, revenue for seed hemp. And it's only about a double, double the acreage there. So um, obviously the, the, the hemp for seed production is coming a little bit higher on that. Floral hemp outside, again, big number, 623 million, which is why so many people are interested in floral hemp. Um, the, the hemp under protection is teased out on not just floral hemp, but um, clones, um, breeding production. So it's a little more complicated, but floral hemp under protection, um, looking at about 310,000 pounds for 64 million revenue in 2021. And then of course the clones and transplant, you see about 20 million plants produced in 2021. Um, so that's just a, a big, big overall picture of what the report has in it. And of course, if you flip through that report, it, it, it's teased out um, in a lot more detail. Uh, but there's that website. If you're interested, please go to it and you can get some more info there. Um, as I said, just last Thursday was our uh, multi-state industrial hemp meeting. Um, here were some of the uh, colleagues, some of the universities who participated in the dual purpose planting. Um, hemp for fiber and grain. Uh, and we had a nice little breakout session where we discussed some of the challenges and, and, and problems that we were having. Um, some of the biggest problems we saw in 2021 were right here, COVID. And you might say like, why did that affect our production? Um, universities, I don't wanna say they shut down, that's not what happened, but getting into work was very difficult. Getting into your buildings was difficult. Some people were not allowed in their offices. I'm very fortunate here working off campus. Um, our farm is pretty isolated, so we didn't have any restrictions. Um, but for a lot of colleagues around the country, just simply getting into work and working with colleagues was challenging. Um, the Great Resignation, lots of people lost farm managers who were close to retirement age and they just and they just jumped. So those are some of the things that are sort of out of our control. Things which may or may not be in our control. Poor establishment was, it was a rough year. Uh, colleagues around the country reported poor establishment on several of these um, plots, several of these varieties, weather related almost always. Weeds are a constant issue. We're still struggling with, with weed issues. There are, uh, Canada has some, has more weed control options than, than we do. Um, I think we'll get there eventually, but so weeds were a big issue for us. We do have colleagues that are doing weed control work. And for the first time, we all knew that birds were going to be an issue that they like uh, hemp grain, obviously. Um, but it was a major part of discussion is how do we control birds? There were some, some colleagues who felt they lost a lot of their grain harvest to, uh, to songbirds. Here on our site, we seem to have a two flocks of two families of turkeys that kind of show up every year at harvest time. And they like to they like to peruse through the plot as, as well. Another issue that we ran into is um, harvest. We had a couple of colleagues who were looking at harvesting grains. They were harvesting via combine. And then they compared that with, um, they did some hand harvest where in theory you get 100% of the harvest when you go out there with pruners and you're cutting off grain heads and, and measuring them. And it seems to be the, the equipment needs some approval. We're losing they we're losing about 50% of their, of their yield um, with, a, with a combine harvest. So there may be some, some engineering opportunities there to improve, to improve grain harvest. Um, our role, what, what did we do last year? Well, one thing we're finding out more and more every year is how important uh, the environment is, along with your genetics and varieties that do well in one part of the country, simply do not do well in other parts of the country. Um, and that's kind of the, the whole purpose of this multi-state trial, the whole purpose of, of this breakout group um, with a dual purpose variety trial is to get some handle on that information, which varieties do well in different locations. The report is not out yet, We're working on it. Colleagues in Kentucky and Florida are working on publications, but we'll, we'll show you some data here in a minute. So last year, we planted 18 varieties, um, 
here at our site, we planted 18 varieties, four by 22 foot plots, four reps. We planted in May, May 12th, nice and early, which was nice. Uh, May 14th, we got an inch and a half of rain and never saw a single seedling. So we waited for the soil to dry out and we were able to plant again on June 8th. And three days later, we got an inch of rain and never saw a single seedling from that. So two plantings and two complete harvest loss for us. We did do a planting date study. Uh, we got an April and a June planting with five varieties. And we did see those through to, to harvest fortune. But these were in the multi-state dual purpose trial. Um, if you check with colleagues around the country, these were the varieties that were planted and those that were successful should have data on those varieties. When the data is presented, um, this is kind of what it looks like. This is kind of a weird graph. Again, I just saw it Thursday for the first time. Um, and just to sort of orient you, here are the varieties. This was the 2020 varieties. We're still looking at the 2021. Um, the way this is broken out is varieties in green in general perform pretty well across the country. Varieties in orange did not perform very well around the country. Uh, the others are sort of in the middle. And the way these graphs are set up, the way they're gonna be presented is, you can see the zero line here across the middle. The zero line is the national average for these varieties. And then we've got the different sites. If the bar is above the zero line, that variety performed better at that site. If it's below the zero line, that variety did not perform as well um, as the national average. And you can see just as you look across these, the huge differences. Um, some of the varieties here, here was ours. These first several varieties performed pretty well above the national average versus perhaps in Kentucky, they did not or in the uh, Kentucky quicksand location didn't. Um, so when this variety is prevent, presented, you'll see lots of differences. Um, New West Genetics 2730 did fairly well across the country. You can see it's got a nice spike at all these different locations. Um, Hiliana Katani did not do very well. Um, GFX did not do very well when it comes to straw. So there's a lot of information wrapped up in one graph. Um, when this data comes up, it's kind of sort of what it's going to look like. And I just want to give you some sort of orientation as to how to how to interpret that, that, that mess. This was grain yields. Um, this was from last year, 2021, just looking at three sites at this point, uh, Cornell at Kentucky and Wisconsin. And again, that's sort of the same idea. The green, um, varieties in green performed pretty well. The varieties in orange did not perform as well. And you can just see the differences. Um, X59 at, at Cornell, outstanding grain yield compared to the national average at Kentucky below average. Um, you, so you can just kind of see how variety matters as you move from upstate New York to Kentucky to the upper Midwest of Wisconsin. Um, variety matters. And that was, again, which is, why we're, which is why we're doing this work. I said, we did get a planting date study in. We planted in April, May, June, July. I was kind of excited about this. To, we wanted to do this for a couple of years. Um, CFX, Hanola, uh, Biolabrowski, Altair and Anka, again, four by 22 foot plots, half an inch deep. I'm going to be showing you April and June data because yes, May got rained out a couple of days after planting and July got rained out a couple of days after planting. You're probably thinking, Jason, why in the world was plant when there's rain forecasted you know, within two or three days? We do know how to read a weather map and look at weather reports and not once were one of those rainfalls forecasted. So, here we've got plant numbers per square meter. April, in, April planting in blue, June planting in orange, varieties down here on the bottom. And you can see the general trend of the April planting. We had more plants per plot, uh, except for Anka, which was basically a, a flat line down here. So now we'd have to repeat this over a few years because obviously every year is gonna be a little bit different. There's probably environmental factors that, that could influence that. Um, but in general, just based on one year's data, our certainly, certainly looks like our April planting did a little bit better as far as plants per square meter, which is not a huge surprise. This is looking at plant height, not as quite large difference. Um, 
kind of a flat line here with CFX, not much of a difference here with Altair. Um, but you can see again, it looks like the April planting certainly produced taller plants at harvest for several of the varieties. Again, not a huge surprise, cooler in the spring, a little less stress, the plants grew a little bit, grew a little bit quicker um, as they're getting established, not a huge surprise. Look at grain yield, again, the April planting versus June, just as a reference, um, we're measuring in grams per square meter, 50 grams per square meter, this line right here is roughly 450 pounds per acre, give or take a few pounds. Um, you can see again, CFX, not much of a difference. Anca, not much of a difference. Panola, maybe a little, the June planting produced a little bit more, um, but by Labrowski, Altair, again, the, the April planting produced a little bit better. So we're starting to see this, not all varieties respond the same. Um, variety matters. And lastly, stem yields, this is your um, fiber, your straw, uh, probably the biggest difference here, which doesn't surprise me here, where you, ha you have to take into consideration here, there's more plants per plot as well. So per square meter, we're seeing definitely an increase with CFX, Hanola, B-Lab, Altair, and Anka, all five varieties. And again, half a pound right here is roughly a ton per acre. Um, again, these are dual purpose, not strictly fiber varieties. Um, I would expect true fiber varieties to be uh, closer to three or four tons per acre, but these are dual purpose varieties. And again, it looks like the April planting is probably a little bit better. We also do, if you're familiar with our process down here, we also do CBD hemp. We, we did run a couple of nice studies last year. Um, our CBD hemp is done inside of a high tunnel, so Mother Nature can't drop a bunch of rain on us and ruin our CBD. Um, projects. So here we generally start with a rooted cutting. Four weeks it's rooted, drop it into a one gallon container. Four weeks later, it's ready to go up into a seven gallon. We move it out to the high tunnel. What we learned during year number one, getting excited, putting our plants in the high tunnel in mid-April, by the time harvest came around in October, we had 12, 15 tall plants that were unmanageable. So one of the things we wanted to look at is what time of the year should we be propagating and moving these things out to the high tunnel so we can get a high quality plant with a good yield that is a manageable size. We had Oddity Stout, Cherry, and Wife as our varieties, grew them out to harvest. And no surprise, May plants were larger, um, but I guess the big surprise is not much of a difference in size wise in June, July, and August plants. Um, the August plants, definitely a little bit thinner, June and July, pretty similar. That's just looks. If we actually look at data, what we're finding is again, so this is biomass, just whole plant biomass, just stripping off leaves and buds. And what we're finding is uh, we've got cherry and blue, white and orange, uh, out of two stout and gray. Finding definitely a decrease from May down to the other months, and definitely a much bigger decrease down in August. We're below a pound per plant. Um, which is probably less than we want to be. Uh, but we're above a pound per plant and really not much of a difference in June or July. So the take home message for this, from my standpoint, from doing research is that whether we get started on June 1st or whether we get started on July 10th, um, we're not having a huge difference in, in, in data, in yield and biomass at the end and we're getting much more manageable plants, um, much easier to deal with. We're getting equal harvest. We did have a little propagation issue with auto two stout in June, which is why it's not there. Um, but we had really overall pretty good success with plants in June and July, which is why in the following years, we're gonna be shooting for basically mid June for our, for our planting date. Another thing we wanted to follow up on is um, nutrition. If you are growing CBD hemp um, and you try to find out what you want to do for nutrition, the recipes are all over the place and they are can be really complicated. You have people that swear by it's got to be uh, compost, it's got to be bat guano, it's got to be worm casting, it's got to be X, Y, or Z, and they swear by it because that's what's worked well for them. Um, 
they're kind of complicated. They're detailed. They're some of them are difficult to follow. So what we wanted to do is, you know, we got almost 50 years here of growing really high quality ornamental plants, trees and shrubs using controlled release fertilizers. And we've been growing pretty good hemp plants with controlled release fertilizer. Controlled release fertilizer is you got these tiny little prills, these little beads here. There's a nutrient package inside those and it's surrounded with a polymer and the thickness and the chemistry of that polymer determines how quickly and how readily the nutrients leach out of that, that prill it's called. So the different technologies, different chemistries, different thicknesses, you can sort of control the rate that the fertilizer, the nutrient package leaks out of that prill. So we were looking at um, two month, three month, five month or an eight month release. And it's a one-time deal. You set your plants out there, you throw down the fertilizer, literally you take a measuring spoon and put down the fertilizer rate that you want and you walk away and you apply nothing but water. Um, we did this in June, harvested in October. We wanted to see what would happen with these different release rates. No surprise, the two month kind of ran out. After you know a few weeks, the plants stopped growing, they got yellow, they turned fall color early, yield was down. Um, but the three, five, and eight months all looked pretty good. Um, this is the variety cherry, which isn't a super tall variety anyway, so it's not a whole lot of difference in height, but you can see how large um, the colas and the leaves are here, and you can see how thin they are here and small they are. So definitely that looks like the five and eight months did a little bit better. Actually look at the numbers, that green line is one pound per plant. We had no trouble achieving more than one pound per plant um, with varieties endurance, cherry and wife with the eight month release on the controlled release fertilizer or the five month release produce really good plants, um, good CBD, good, good cannabinoid content, uh, healthy plants that were pretty easy to take care of. Basically wait till it looks like fall in there, call Braden, have him come take a sample, tell us that we're all legal, cut them, hang them, process them, and, and we're off and going. And I think I'm almost out of breath. That wraps it up for me. That's just kind of a quick summary of what 2021 brought us and a little bit on the on the national stage. I'll hand it back to you, Frank. Um, welcome again for here, being here with us today. And uh, your presentation is usually as usual, very complete, very uh, candid. We, we know that even experts have challenges and, and that agriculture is such that you know, when you're in a outside and not in a controlled environment, a lot of things can happen. And it's not a pleasure to have these type of situations, but you learn a lot from, from this type of thing. So appreciate you sharing with us uh, your challenges and, and what you see uh, going, going forward. I believe there is a, there's a question for you in the, in the, in the chat. There's another question regarding a petition list. There's a time for that will be addressed probably by Kelly. So just be a little patient with us on how these things get, get answered. But thank you, Dr. Griffin, again, and look forward to continue in communication with you and looking forward to that cider. Okay. Robin, welcome, yes. and I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you, Frank. And we are, it looks like we're about 10 minutes behind schedule. So to respect everybody's time, it is my pleasure to introduce Dana Ladner. Um, without your leadership at KDA, girl, goodness gracious, I don't know where we'd be. So um, Dana is Kansas Department of Agriculture's Compliance Education Coordinator. She has been with KDA since October of 2014. In her role as Compliance Education Coordinator, she assists the agency with education and outreach opportunity, opportunities internally and externally to the agency. Dana has been involved with the ongoings of industrial hemp in Kansas since outreach began in 2019 and the first application period was open. She has given presentations literally across the state from Topeka to Bird City to Sublet to Fort Scott with many stops in between. Dana and her husband, Jimmy, live in Manhattan and they have five adult children. 
Bless you, Dana. Uh, their family enjoys K-State K sports, the Royals and Chiefs, golfing, and being outside. Take it away, Dana. Great. Thank you very much, Robin. Appreciate that. So I'm um, going to hope that the screen's up. If not, I'm sure somebody will let me know. So I just want to go through with a quick update from KDA if there is such a thing with that. Um, and so let's just start off, which many of you know uh, about hemp and how we're regulated in the state that we started in 2019 with it from the passage of the 24 Teen Farm Bill gave us that opportunity to do that. And since uh, January 2021, we've been able to uh, uh, grow commercially from the 2018 Farm Bill and that Kansas does have a, an approved USDA plan to be able to have that program. Uh, the table that's right beside us here uh, talks about the state plans and we've got 45 of those, but then we also have five states that are operating under the USDA uh, plan with that. We've got two territories that have a, an approved plan, and uh, we've got tribes that also have that plan to include here in Kansas, the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation, and the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. Uh, as everybody on here probably already knows that in Kansas, we regulate producers, also known as growers, and that we license them here through the Kansas Department of Agriculture and that licenses um, must be submitted and that deadline is March 15th. Uh, all the rules and regulations are available to you online for the commercial uh, program and they can be found on our website at agriculture.ks.gov backslash industrial hemp. So we've had some changes and amendments since we met last year with it. And so once the USDA's final rule came out in January, uh, the Industrial Hemp Advisory Board met and on March 19th uh, provided some comments for some changes to be made, which those included the, to extend that harvest window from 15 days to 30 days uh, for the, that sampling date. Hot hemp would uh, now be eligible for remediation. And then there were also changes to the negligent violation thrust threshold. So. KDA got that information, rounded up to Topeka with it for approval, and that was temporary, temporarily adopted in August of 2021 and uh, was on a permanent basis there in December. So the permanent rules uh, regulations were effective on December 17th of last year. So let's take a look at those real quick. Um, we amended the harvest piece of it on harvest dates that it's now 30 days of since sampling and you have that information that that you have a compliant sample so you can begin that harvest so that was pretty exciting stuff uh, with that amendment. Uh, we also had the amendment that plants that were produced uh, hot above that 0.3% THC, there's an opportunity now for remediation, and that needs to be done within 30 days of an issuance of a failing report of analysis. So that was, again, a good addition to the industry with that. So um, excited about those things that we had going on. I'm trying to get caught up here on the time, so kind of buzzing through here. But again, uh, you guys know where, where to find this stuff on our, our webpage with that. So, and the final piece that was amended that was on the negligent violations. So uh, we move that up to 1% THC rather than that 0.5% that had been provided in the interim rule. So processors, that was a big change for 2021. Hemp processors are now uh, regulated through the Kansas Fire Marshal's office and they have a hemp processor registry. So that information is available and out there for you at their website. And when you go to firemarshal.ks.gov backslash 334, this is the page that you're going to find. And so the fire marshal is in Topeka and the processing information can be found there. And I know from talking with those in the industry that they're really willing to work with our processors. So excited about that. So, you know, we're, we're all working together on behalf of the industry. 
So let's just get to the chase on what you guys really want to look at and see um, on the industrial hemp acreages um, licensed and planted over the last three years as we take a look at it. And we know that licensed acres are always a, a larger number with it compared to the planted and harvested. But what I really want to point out is in that second uh, set of sentences that in 2019 and 2020, the acres that were reported as planted in our state, approximately 90% of that was for floral or CBD production. But in 2021, that number dropped to about 26 acres planted for floral or CBD production, whereas grain and fiber uh, that was about 19% of the planted acres. Seed and grain, 23%, and fiber increased to 31% of the planted acres, respectively. Uh, we, we hear about reports being due, and KDA has a number of reports being due, but also with those planted acres, let's not forget that the USDA uh, Farm Service Agency also has reports that are due, and so make sure that you check in with your local FSA office with that, because like I say, those reports are so important with it so we can keep track in the industry and how Kansas is doing uh, nationwide with that. So we have those planted acres, we have these harvested acres as well. And the numbers um, are, are pretty true to what, what we figured, but I wanted to uh, bring to your guys' attention about non-compliant acres or things that test hot. That first year we planted um, in 2019, about 54 acres were hot. And that decreased to 34 acres in 2020. And then in 2021, we dropped to just 0 0.06 acres for non-compliant. And that was after we'd adopted that 30-day sampling window in 2021. So as Dr. Griffin had already mentioned, um, 2021 had some crazy things going on with it. And with that, um, a large percentage of, of the acres that were planted that were non-yielding, you know, they, they failed because of poor germination and emergence or adverse weather. So um, germination is so important. And I know right now folks are talking about seed and getting seed in and where to order seeds. So as Dr. Griffin has noted, and, and folks have really proven that the genetics are super important. And then Kansas weather, uh, yesterday was shorts weather and today the wind chill is minus zero. So you just never know what you're gonna get here in the state. This is just a quick look from last year on uh, the counties in Kansas that planted uh, industrial hemp compared to those that actually harvested. So you can see where some of those events uh, for weather came through and or folks just had um, poor seeds uh, on emergence with that. But let's just take a look here at this bottom set of information that um, 57 of the 81 licenses conducted planting activity. So um, which was about 70% of those that could. But out of those 57, 38 or about 66% conducted a harvest. So. Um, the numbers really just kind of drop down there, but it is, again, so important here in the state to, to get all those factors right that we have any control over. Uh, Dr. Griffin uh, touched here on the, the NAS data that was out. He focused on one point, and I'm going to focus on another. Uh, uh, in Kansas, uh, we had about 400, 540 acres that were reported uh, in uh, to be grown in those open areas with about 400 acres planted. So this is the first time that USDA NAS has published these estimates on industrial hemp. So again, it's really important on these reports for our industry to be able to grow within our state and nationwide. Uh, this uh, bit of information is actually from the, the uh, multi-state meeting that Dr. Griffin presented at last week in Braden Hoke. And Jason Teal from KDA, we and myself, we also sat in on it. Here's just a quick snapshot of looking at uh, hemp production nationwide, according to the FSA, with it and how those numbers really peaked in 2019. And then the second graph really looks at 
groups that started growing um, from the 2014, 2018 farm bills and getting legislation passed to be able to do that. So just a, a quick look of how things have grown um, in the United States and, and where we're taken off across different groups uh, that have been active with it. So we're just gonna jump here um, as a reminder that licenses again are due on March 15th. And uh, with that, all the other licenses that had, did expire at the end of December, except for those educational institutions where they have a multi-year uh, license with that. As of last week on February 17th, KDA had issued 24 licenses and we had three uh, under review at that time. So we can uh, make sure we lead you again to that website, um, agriculture.ks.gov backslash industrial hemp. All that information can be found on licenses at that website with that. So uh, what, what are we thinking about Kansas in production for 2022? From the licenses that have been submitted, it looks like again, we're gonna have a decrease in acreage, but of the acres that are planted, the majority of that acreage uh, will be dedicated to grain and fiber where floral production, floral production will most likely fall in acreage. But as a side note with these numbers, uh, last year, about 50% of all applications came in after the first week of March. So we still have time on that. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring forward uh, from the meeting from last week is this hemp budget model from the University of Kentucky. Um, and just that the, you know, there's a wide um, and varied uh, types of production within uh, the industrial hemp industry and with growers. And that to really make note, if you're going to be using budget models with what you're doing is to make sure that you really go in and change those lines and those numbers to match your specific uh, production practice and what you have for cost because everybody is different with it. And so this is just a reminder on it that if you're going to be using uh, models with it to make sure that you customize those for your specific operation. So uh, this specific model uh, looks at some positive numbers for grain and fiber and, uh, and some negative numbers down there um, with the CBD piece. But again, everybody's different and models are exactly that, models. So uh, I'm just going to finish up here as a reminder to get the information there on the Industrial Hemp homepage and Braden Hoke and Jason Teal can sure help you out with any questions that you have. Uh, but I also wanted to end up on two great things that are happening at KDA right now, and you may have heard a couple of those. And I know a lot of you on the call um, from Kansas have uh, outside interests besides the industrial hemp industry that may be in agriculture. So if you're a farmer, rancher, agribusiness manufacturer, with it, there's a current ag workforce needs assessment survey going on. So if you have your phone handy, you can take a quick photo of that QR code and go directly to the survey, or you can get that at um, a shortcut at tinyurl.com backslash workforce 2022. And that survey is open till the first week of April. And it is super important that we have a great representation of the ag industry and the workforce needs for the future. And the other thing is the kansasagstress.org website. Um, Production, agriculture, manufacturing, processing are super stressful, and we all know that, and everybody has stressors. So there's a website out there on the state of Kansas website, and we know everybody's different. Men, women, young adults, you know, veteran farmers, uh, farm families, and aging adults that are in production, and everybody has different needs. So just a reminder, do not put your mental health aside or think we can all handle it, that there's something out there for all of us to help. And so if you need help, please reach out, check out some of these resources. And this is an evolving page. So if folks have some contacts um, for some information that may not be on that resource page, let me know. We definitely wanna share as much information as we can. So again, um, thank you very much for your time today. With it, I breezed over things rather quickly with that. And so, um, Robin, I will go ahead and turn it back to you and the rest of the team. Thank you.
always appreciate it. Kelly put it in the chat. Um, data is where we're at. And Kansas has always been about the data. And Dina and both uh, Dr. Griffin, you guys mentioned variety is key. So those are my takeaways so far. Um, next, you kind of got us back on, on track time-wise. Dana, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to introduce Kelly. Those of you who don't know Kelly Ripple, he is one of Kansas's most passionate advocates for hemp. He is helping to establish a global presence for when Kansas grown hemp is ready for that center stage. Kelly is co-founder of Kansans for Hemp, founding president of Planted Association of Kansas. He also serves on the hemp advisory board for KDA. We will all be seeing more of him around the Capitol as he continues to provide pivotal testimony for the legislative bills that will have a huge impact on our collective futures in Kansas's hemp industry. And now Kelly, will you please give us the update on where Kansas is in our current legislative agenda? All right, thank you. Yes, Robin, thank you so much. And, and thank you for all that you've done over the years um, in these efforts with me as a, as a fellow co-founder of Kansans for Hemp. You've done so much for this, for this effort. So I, I very much appreciate it. For those who don't know, um, Robin and I have been friends since we were uh, little, and it was a, it was a theater performance connection, and so um, we've been having this labor of love of getting the word out about hemp uh, prior to 2016. And again, Dana, thank you, and everyone uh, who has um, presented so far, who's on today. I'm just extremely grateful for everyone who's participating. Um, and for the Department of Ag and, and the, the hemp program staff for all of that you have done. Uh, thanks to our gracious, ho gracious hosts as well. So all of this is 100% a group effort. Um, it's, in it's inspiring to me. Uh, I will say, uh, you know, to say that the reintroduction of hemp has, has been rocky is an understatement, both from a policy perspective and, and from, you know, just growing in general. We knew 2019 was a rough year. As we can see, 2020, 21 one has been rough year, years as well. Um, we've seen a shift already to the, the fiber and grain, which makes sense for traditional uh, row crop farmers. And key players are demonstrating some really incredible things that can be done with hemp. And so, you know, our, our mission, uh, my mission in particular, is to make sure that policy is updated to the point where it makes sense for all of the stakeholders involved and that you have a, a representation in the state house. And I know Kevin Barone, who I just spoke with, um, with Capital Lobby Group, uh, with Planted Association of Kansas, he also um, makes that happen as well. And so uh, in January, I just wanted to share that I had a Zoom meeting with USDA Hemp Program Director Bill Richmond, and he confirmed that, you know, Kansas had been traditionally been the strictest program in the nation. He did express that we're moving in the right direction, and I think that can clearly be shown um, by the data that uh, both Dr. Griffin and Dana has, has expressed. And even though we have an up and down with the fluctuation of CBD markets, which uh, if you've been watching the, the hemp space for any number of years, you knew that that was going to be happening. Really, the, the, what now can um, fully be expressed is, is the embracing of the <laughs> 50,000 plus products that can be made from hemp. And so, um, you know, when I expressed concerns from a Kansas farmer perspective to Mr. Richmond, he did say that there may be some provisions within the 2023 Farm Bill that we can perhaps look forward to um, that may deal with things like licensing, um, because he mentioned the office does recognize that farmers want they want hemp to be treated like any other crop, such as wheat, corn, soybeans. And so to this end, uh, there may be some possible changes that could occur in the licensing provisions. We will kind of just have to wait and see. However, I think that there is another positive aspect from the federal level, and that is um, I recently noticed that the, the risk management agency now has a rule that includes having processing contracts in place. So if you have uh, crop insurance for your, your hemp crops, this to me shows that USDA is putting priority on sustainability of building the hemp supply chain. So through ensuring that there's a commitment in place from a processor, which is a best practice, that crucial connection all the way from seed to manufacture can be completed. And so that ultimately is going to protect everyone um, who's involved. Now, particularly with uh, state regulation, what's been going on in the state house after the 2021 session ended, um, 
hemp advocates and colleagues, we began working on an updated kind of commercial program that is going to be inclusive of all hemp products and make them legal. Uh, we knew that that needed to be passed by the legislature. However, in the meantime, there has been some confusion about some products, particularly in the Delta 8 and some of those other variant um, end products from a law enforcement perspective, because after uh, the legislature passed uh, 2020, 2244, that allowed full spectrum products to be sold in the state. And um, they didn't know at that point whether Delta A products were legal or not. And that led to a an, an opinion that came out from the Attorney General Derek Schmidt's office in December. And um, what that ultimately kind of showed or demonstrated is that Delta 8 is technically unlawful unless it comes from legal industrial hemp. And if you know where Delta 8 comes from, it's, it's um, synthesized through CBD products, the majority of those products, if not all of them on the market do come from legal industrial hemp because you have to have a massive amount of biomass to create those products because it's not a, uh, a, a high naturally of forming. It is naturally occurring in cannabis, but not in large quantities. So you have to have a large amount. And they figured out through CBD, um, you can create Delta-8. So that's, we had a lot of biomass on the market from 2019, 2020, farmers couldn't sell it. The market's tanked. And so that's kind of where the, the whole Delta-8 and other products have come from. And then, like I said, in December, uh, Attorney um, General Schmidt's office came out with this. And it, it did say, uh, ultimately, that the legislature needs to act. And I agree that we need to have the legislature come to terms with what the true intent is of the legislature. Um, and that is that, you know, all products that are, are made from hemp can, can be legal if, if the hemp is legal itself. Um, 2563 is a bill that is now in the House. Uh, I prov provided testimony in neutral, um, and it, it was an important bill that this is um, going to introduce hemp into the state seed law, and that's for the kind of the dis distribution through the Department of Agriculture, and it also codified the advice this state advisory board um now i i should kind of you know reiterate the fact that right now you can purchase all kinds of hemp products uh in kansas stores throughout the state seed hemp hearts powder um some are made in the state but most of them are, are made from other states and other countries and you can also find uh, at smoke shops, you know, gummies and candy that are marketed as having Delta 8, Delta 9, 10, HHC, and all these others. Uh, you, you can also find packaged flour and cigarettes, vape cartridges, even though those are technically um, considered unlawful right now under current statute. And so we had been working on this, you know, updated language that would, um, that would kind of remediate this these issues and uh it would it would lay it out in cl clear plain language and also be consistent with the chemistry and scientific um makeup of of thc itself and so we're hoping now that the legislature has this opportunity they can clarify you know what, what these products are whether they're legal um and i also want to mention that there's a, a second step that is important in that um Another House Bill 2708 is going to be a, a very important public health driven um, approach to ensuring we have quality assurance within the state. So we know moving forward, medical cannabis is going to be heard. Um, my understanding is it will be heard this session. There's enough momentum and um, you know they're they're kind of waiting right now on a vehicle bill, um, and and you know we will hear hear more about that as we move forward. But in order to have a robust, uh, comprehensive program, you have to have testing and quality assurance. And so we need to have a program that is going to require labeling, so consumers know what's what's in the products that they're um, consuming. And so 
uh, those are kind of some of the highlights of the policy items that are happening. I want to encourage everyone here today, um, you know, reach out to us, reach out to each other and contact your people like your extension agent office, your, your farm bureau and, and farmers union rep. Tell your elected officials um, why this is important to you, what you know about hemp and what their stance is on it. And that can be your local, your county, state, Congress person. Um, and if you're interested in growing or, or learning how protection might look like, uh, if you're wanting to grow a crop, you know, talk to your, your crop insurance agent or talk to the people, the, your neighbors about it and see how it may benefit from you. Um, the evolution of this is going to continue only uh, through collaboration and, and co-opetition and uh, supporting each other. Uh, as the hemp industry gets rebuilt. And so, uh, for example, I know Dr. Griffin's probably gonna be on it, but tomorrow there's a, another USDA and Cornell hemp webinar on processing. So, um, you know, there's there are things happening all the time and uh, we're always happy to share information and, um, and share connections. And so with that, I would like to um, introduce Jim Garman, if I can. And we, I don't know if we'll have time to do question and answer um, later, but we can definitely entertain that perhaps. Um, awesome, James, can you, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, can you hear me? Okay, yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, James Garman is with Canico and I had the pleasure of visiting his uh, his plot in Manhattan last year, and it was just it was fascinating. I've been to multiple ones, and but I just I loved being there and hearing what he had going on and seeing it with my own eyes. It was it was really great. So thank you again for having us out last year. Um, so I'll I'll just start it off. Tell us about what your experience is as a Kansas hemp farmer, um, and a little bit about your personal and professional history. Yeah, totally. Well, yeah, thank you for uh, for having me. I'm, I'm I'm excited to be here, and and uh, it's, it's a privilege to be a part of this fantastic group. Um, you know, 2019 is when it started for me, and I think really in retrospect, really what we've been trying to do is just we're kind of in the pursuit of figuring out how to you know farm hemp um, economically. Um, so, you know, 19 is kind of when we cut our teeth with uh, focus on floral plants and we worked with, uh, you know, small, I think about 5,500 clones is what we did there. And, and you know, we, uh, we suffered losses from cross pollination with the, you know, the feral hemp. And this was up in North Central Kansas, Jewel County, where I'm from. Um, 2020, we did uh, floral again, but we tried some different methodologies where we did direct seeding, um, again, on that pursuit of economic uh, scale. Um, and we had about a 60% germination rate, and that was on um, an autoflower variety, so a day neutral. So we were dealing with smaller plants, just a higher population. Um, but again, we were dealing with the same issues, and this was in Riley County here in Manhattan, Kansas, um, with the with the cross pollination. And then last year in 2021, we did um, we we scaled back the the floral uh, acreage and plant count considerably. I think we were down about 1,200 plants. We went with uh, Oregon CBD sour RNA autoflower, so it was one of the seedless varieties that they have, meaning that it's impermeable to pollen. Now. The caveat to that was is that we planted it right next to about three acres of the fiber crop, which is what you came up and, um, you know, we had the, you guys came and visited and checked it out and whatnot. Um, so, you know, it's been, it's been a rough ride, you know, like, uh, like I think it has for a lot of people. It's been a learning experience for sure, but um, it's also been fun because, you know, if it wasn't challenging, I don't think we'd have any fun doing it, would we? Um, so, you know, 2021 was our best year for sure. We, we got better at it. Um, we had a really good fiber crop uh, turnout and it, uh, we intentionally planted a small acreage specifically for research and development. Uh, we used the New West Genetics 2730, which is, you know, something that's come up a couple of times here. I know Wendy Mosier is on the call. She is the CEO of that organization. Um, Jason Griffin also had uh, a lot of information on that from previous years and I consulted with him before pulling the trigger. Um, so, you know, we had a lot of success, you know, playing with different uh, uh, planting rates, uh, seed depth, all that good stuff. 
So if there are any particular questions that anybody has, feel free to send them over and I can kind of tell you what we're doing this year versus last year. If anybody has any questions that I can answer on uh, planting, harvesting, management, whatever, I'll do my best to do it. Awesome. We'll Anyways. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that. So with this new crop and it's a new industry, you've worked through, you know, kind of a lot of changes in the first four years of, of producing in Kansas and building a, a brand with hemp products, right? So what is the most positive progression or, or change that you've witnessed so far? And what's the most positive or, or important change that you, that you think uh, is, has yet to be made? You know, the most positive progression is, I think, what we're doing right here. Everybody coming together to help each other get through, you know, all the challenges. Um, you know, there's been uh, um, an emergence of leaders in the industry in the state. I think a lot of them are on this call. We've had some uh, really um, uh, influential entrepreneurs, um, you know, Melissa Nelson, South Bend Hemp, I think. You know, they're really killing it, really leading the charge in the uh, on the fiber seed side. And so I think a lot of people can look to them for a lot of uh, different information. MHTs come around, Sears Group. Um, so the support systems are there. That's huge progress for the state, you know, because if you are a, a first time producer and you're interested in this, it's a, it's a considerable investment. It definitely has its risks. So, you know, unless you are working with these types of groups that have a heck of a lot of experience um, and, and really understand the agronomic side of, of the farming operation, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's definitely worth doing the due diligence. Um, otherwise, you know, I've, I've been really impressed with the Kansas Department of Agriculture. I can't say enough good about them. They are super supportive. They're very fast to answer questions, addressing needs. If you, you know, with the commercial program, we can do uh, additions of acreage or buildings or whatever it might be within reason. And they're just uh, superb as far as um, addressing any kind of uh, adjustments that we might need. Planting clones or direct seeding. So it looks like I got a question here. Do you want to be okay? okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Keith Smiley says, um, question is planting clones over direct seeding. How about weed control? Um, again, I think it really depends on your operation and where you, you know, what, to, what your desired outcome is and, and what you're trying to control as far as your end product. Um, clones to me was just a heck of a lot of extra work. So when the economic side came around to it, it, it wasn't all that economical for us individually. Now, if you have the infrastructure on the front side to propagate clones and whether you're running it, um, uh, you know, to, to keep those um, ready to go into transplantation, then it could be okay. Uh, we control with clones. Again, we went with raised beds and plastic, but by the time we put the plastic down, we had a heck of a windstorm come through and blew it all away anyway. So we were battling weeds that year regardless. Um, now direct seeding, it's, it's a challenge outside with the floral uh, varieties and it really depends on you know your access to resources so irrigation probably would be a, a safe bet for direct seeding uh, floral varieties otherwise just hope you get it planted shallow enough with uh, a decent soft nice rain at the right time and and you might be able to get i don't know 75 80 percent uh, germination rates um, and then weed control again with direct seeding we usually go with uh, 30 inch rows um, just a regular planter and, and try to plant within about a quarter inch and just use mechanization uh, like a like a row cultivator to handle the weeds in that um, in that case. Gary Upaw says uh, experience of plants that were impervious to pollination. Did they remain unpollinated? That's a good question. Um, they did not, but they had um, very minor cross pollination. So we ended up with seeded flower from that sour RNA autoflower from Oregon CBD, uh, but it wasn't very bad. They're just they're they're designed and engineered specifically not to pollinate. But the fact that we had it right next to a fiber crop, I don't think we could have blasted it anymore with pollen. So I was pretty impressed, really, with the end product. Going forward, what we're planning to do this year is bring all the floral stuff indoors and go with full spectrum LEDs, almost like you would in the MJ side, um, and go again with that sour RNA autoflower seed green, and we can probably, we're gonna plan to run right into rock wool. And I think we can control the, the uh, progression of those plants, because with the, with the autoflower, 
we don't necessarily have to worry about the photo period, right? So we can hit them with 18 hours on and then go off. And, and outdoors, we harvested in 65 days. I think indoors, we can accelerate that closer to 55. Um, but time to tell. So it, that answers your question. Inside, I covered inside. Okay. Yeah, Any other like, questions, Kelly? Well, there was a there was a question there about nettles and rotation with hemp and fi for fiber. Um, yeah, and, and nettles have, I've heard that have been has been used before um, as at least as, as a cover, perhaps. But um, I wanted to ask, you know, since it, it seems like obviously you've taken a very thoughtful approach to this, and mm -hmm. and you know, there's a lot of exploration involved with what what you're building around hemp. So. Uh, I know we hear a lot of people who have been on the journey of growing hemp, say, you know, start small. And, and is that your advice for people in ag? Because, you know, kind of going back to what Dana was saying, we, we do, it is best practice to have budget um, models and things like that, because we don't really want to bet the farm on it. But uh, I, I think that people can find, find their niche because there are so many um, end markets for this. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, I'm, I've always been, and we, and like I said, you know, we've kind of been in research development phase since day one um, to try and find and, and kind of catch that stride. I think small is, smaller is safe, in my opinion, and it really depends, again, on your particular situation, maybe capital at hand, experience, all those things. But let's just say that those are limited resources, then I'd say the best thing you can do is to start small to get, you know, acclimated. You know, and I think the fact of the matter is on the on the floral side, a little bit of high quality hemp is going to go a long way. So for us at Canico, being a um, a brand that's that's um, moving high quality product, you know, we don't need a, you know 10, 15, 20 acres. I mean, we can do that uh, as long as we're harvesting, you know, at least once a month on rotation. I think we'll, we'll be fine with a smaller flow through with us. Um, and then on the fiber side, it's the same thing. It's um, you know, everybody on the panel has touched on this before, genetics, genetics, genetics. You know, you have to invest, it's, it's better off investing in the right genetics from square one and putting, you know, those uh, best practices in place. And if you're, if you, if you really don't know, then lean on the partners like the MHTs and the South Bend Hemp's. Those are the ones that, um, you know, are gonna be able to, to, to guide you through some of these things, particularly in the state of Kansas. So I think, um, yeah, unless you have access to those resources, or if you're concerned about those things, um, starting small is probably the safest bet. I totally agree. And like you said, I mean, we've got some great resources here with the small business development centers and our research ag extension offices. I mean, we, there, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of good resources available. So what can your, what do you think some, uh, some other maybe examples of how fellow Kansans can support your farm and uh, your Kansas grown Kansas made hemp products? Um, well, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, it, supporting us is supporting all of us together. You know, when we get together on these calls like this, we push forward with, with the positivity that's come through with the things that have happened in a positive manner for Kitty on the processing side, you know, limitations in the uh, THC percentage. That helps us too. Um, you know, and feel free, you can tell people about us. It's canicocbd.com. Um, we have two different channels. So if there's anything um interesting you know feel free to tell everybody i mean we do appreciate that that'd be helpful um but otherwise um if there are any questions I'll, you know if, if we're you know pressed for time here if there are any questions i'll put my uh, email address in the chat here and um you guys can reach out directly if you'd like to Excellent. And I will put mine out there as well. We really appreciate it. Jim, thank you for, for coming on today and, and offering your insight. Um, I'm really excited for this, um, the, the closing here and I'll, I'll pass it to you, Sarah, and thank you for hosting today. And the, your, your best practices guide, I think is, is going to be a, a good piece, good takeaway for folks. So thank you all for having me. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Jim. It's such a, you're such a great guest because you have experience on the fiber and the CBD side of growing, and that's, um, you're just an, an impersonation, you're in, in the flesh, the evolution that the whole hemp industry has taken in Kansas and all across the country, 
And, you know, there's room and there's important roles for each of those types of crops to play. And we just appreciate you explaining how it's worked and uh, being on the Ask a Producer segment today. And um, if anybody has questions, James' company is Canico. And you can find him active on social media and, of course, his website, K-A-N-N-A-C-O. And we appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Glad to have you. We're going to wrap up and appreciate everybody staying with us today. It's been a great turnout and a great um, continuity through the event. But to wrap up, we want to make sure that today's goal is to just share resources and to let you know that there are a lot of people available, organizations that want to help, that can help you learn to grow, can help you through the licensing, can help you through the regulations, can help you through the processing, can help you through marketing your crop. Um, but the first thing you're going to have to do is grow. And the first thing you're going to have to do to grow is get a license before March 15th. And so we want to really emphasize how important that is. You have to have fingerprints on file, so that takes a little bit of time. It has to be received in the KDA's office by March 15th. So today's 222. If you want to be a grower this year, you're going to have to get busy today. And like I think Dana said, they've only received 24 growers licenses in the um, in their office so far, uh, they do anticipate at least another 24 or 25. It sounded like you got more than half of your licenses in after March 1st last year. Um, so it's going to be crunch time. And if we can help you get through crunch time and get your licensing uh, paperwork turned in, please reach out because we really want to grow the number of producers um, in the state of Kansas. We want to grow the hemp industry in Kansas. We want to grow the number of licensed and harvested acres. And to do that, we have to have producers. So if we can be helpful to you as a grower, as a producer of industrial hemp, please reach out. The Kansas Hemp Consortium is conducting grant-funded um, research growing this year. So we're working with five producers and we're testing grain varieties of seed from New West Genetics. And Wendy with New West Genetics is on today. We're going to try some different densities and some different uh, planting techniques, but these are the things that New West Genetics densities, like we just said, weed control methods, timing of production, like Dr. Griffin said, we're really going to try to get in the ground a lot earlier this year. Um, we had producers last year waiting until June, and it just, um, we were unable to control the weeds once we waited that long. So we're trying to get in the ground earlier, and with proven genetics, proven techniques, and um, a proven seed supplier. And Wendy, can you, or Mindy, can you advance the slide? I don't see, there we go. These are um, some of the test plots from New West Genetics and you can just see um, the, the places in the country. So where you get your seed, a lot of it's from Canada these days, a lot of it's from Europe. Um, New West Genetics is bred in Colorado and then in different states around the United States that um, make it probably a good fit for Kansas. Um, of course, you can't control the weather, and there's a lot to the technique and the timing, but as far as proven genetics, that's what we're going to be studying at the Hemp Consortium this year is the um, NWG varieties. So if we can be helpful to you in making that connection, uh, you're welcome to reach out to NWG. They're on the call today. Um, but if you have other questions, I think it's also important to note you choose your variety based on your end result. So if you want to grow for grain, you want to grow for fiber, you want to grow for herd, those are different, um, different options. I see Eric Singular from um, International Hemp is on, Hanola, another good variety. There are resources, folks. So if you want to grow, connect with people that have done this for now. We're on our fourth season and we want to link arms with other growers in the state and just grow the industry generally. So I think I wanted to give Robin a chance. If if she can jump on and say a little bit more about um, resources provided by Kansans for Hemp and Planted Association, how you guys are helpful to folks. And then Frank will wrap us up. Great. Well, Kansans for Hemp um, is a, a great platform on social media to stay up to date on what's going on with our legislature. Um, we often share things that are resources from partners, the relationships that we're establishing here in Kansas, as well as information that is being shared globally um, across the country and other states that are, they're paving the way for us to learn from their mistakes and be better than. 
Um, I know our time, we're losing participants as this goes on. So if it's okay, Sarah, I'm gonna just skip right to our next event and then the closing. Is that okay with you? Yeah, let's just wrap it up. Okay, so our next event, just to reiterate, is Thursday, May 5th at 10 a.m. And because you registered today, you will get that access um, just in advance. You're our VIPs now. We are working to confirm those speakers from May right now, but we can share. We've got South Bend Industrial Hemp, who is going to represent. And then we'll have an update from Kansas Canna Chamber. Before we go, I know some people are already leaving. Um, I was glad to see we had over 80 participants, but it's time for us to give away our gift, our prize basket. And that winner is Lori Montgomery. So if you are still on here, Lori, congratulations. You are getting all those fabulous, <laughs> those fabulous prizes. And we are eager to see who wants to send prizes for, <laughs> yay, Lori, good job, Jennifer, uh, for the May event. If you have some things that you want to contribute, we'll absolutely give a shout out to, to you and your entity. Um, so let us know. Special thanks, of course, to Mindy at Pittsburgh State University. Your technical support today was phenomenal. You made all of these slides happen. And thank you again to all of you for joining us. Again, the deadline to apply for a licensure with the KDA and become an international or an industrial hemp producer this year is March 15th. So start planning now, you guys, to get that application in and search the Kansas Hemp Consortium and Kansans for Hemp for more information. Thank you, everyone, presenters, participants. We're doing good work. Keep up the work. Let's grow hemp. Yes. Oh, <laughs> Have an awesome rest you, of Robin. Day, everybody. Thank you, Robin. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Again, especially to the Kansas Hemp Consortium, Kansas for Hemp Planet Association, and on behalf of the Wichita State University SBDC, and once again, I want to say in front of everybody and for, for what is worth, thank you, Mindy. Uh, Mindy has been such a great help for so many events and for so many things. And um, Mindy is closing this chapter and moving into a new chapter in her book. And we're, she is going to be sorely missed, not just by the hemp crowd, by so many people in the KSBDC network. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mindy. A lot of these things wouldn't have been possible without you. And we appreciate you, appreciate you so much. So again, thank you for being here. We look forward to seeing you in May. See you all on May 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy.